Hey guys, Dani here from UniRise. Just before we start today's interview, a quick reminder to check out our free How to Write Your Personal Statement Masterclass and University Application Guide at unirise.co.uk. And if you've already written your personal statement, you can get it professionally reviewed by one of our specialist statement reviewers. So hi everyone, welcome back to another UniRise student interview. I am joined today by Sasha, who's in her second year studying modern and medieval languages at the University of Cambridge. Thank you for being with us today, Sasha. Thank you for having me, I'm excited. So can you start by taking us through a typical day or a typical week? I know maybe it might be a bit different now being online, but whatever you can. Yeah, so usually um, things will be split into language papers, which is the more kind of um, grammar side and um, that will be oral supervisions as well, which is kind of small group teaching where you're um, just speaking in your target language. Um, and then you'll have scheduled papers as well. Um, so in first year, all the scheduled papers are chosen for you. Um, and then progressing on, you get to choose them a bit more. Um, and all those scheduled papers are, it's kind of anything outside of the realm of specific language or grammar teaching. So it'll be literature, cinema, linguistics, history. Um, and you won't have usually all of those things, but you'll have a few. Um, and then in a typical week or in, in a fortnight, I'd have probably two scheduled papers supervisions um, and about two or three language supervisions or classes. Um, and then on top of that, I'd have lectures, which right now are obviously online and all pre-recorded. Um, and then I might have a, the odd seminar as well, which is kind of maybe per paper, once or twice a term so that's just kind of a step between um a lecture and a supervision so kind of varying degrees of um interaction or kind of bigger groups smaller groups but generally quite a lot of contact which is great um and so i'd say probably the average day would be about two contact hours um and then the rest of the time would be kind of reading preparing for um, lectures or supervisions for the rest of that week and then obviously relaxing as well and making the most of being in Cambridge. Right, um, you mentioned the the lectures being a bit bigger groups so the papers are those, how are those taught just because um, some courses will use modules or papers considered modules then? Yeah so a paper is like a module um, and what we do which I'm not sure how this compares to other universities but I think when I was doing my research back in sixth form a lot of universities seem to do a module for a term whereas all of my modules will go completely throughout the year um so and then and they're called papers I think it's just another name for what's exactly the same thing um and then we'll have lectures throughout um both the terms uh both the first two terms and then culminating in the final term that won't be any new content it will just be revision for exams or not at all if you've already had coursework um and so yeah the papers are kind of just I think fancy word for modules basically okay thanks um and you mentioned the oral supervisions and the language supervisions um so what's the difference between the two and maybe can you give us an example yeah sure so um I did ab initio Spanish, which means I had never done it before. Um, so for that one, in first and second year, I've been having oral supervisions, which is just an hour a week of pure ch like chatting, basically, with somebody in the target language with my supervisor, who is um, from a Spanish-speaking country. And it's a lot looser of a format. It's not as... Um, kind of structures as the grammar supervisions which I had in first year which were um, you kind of would come with questions or maybe you're working through um, different conjugations or like grammatical rules and that's a lot more structured but um, the oral supervisions you might have to read we usually read an article beforehand um, and then come ready to discuss it in the supervision and um, usually it's quite kind of controversial like hot topics of the moment um 
so that it kind of sparks debate and you always have something to talk about. Um, but yeah, those are really great because they're very relaxed and it actually gets you to kind of start having to speak spontaneously. Um, and then the grammar ones are slightly different, but um, they're also in the target language, so it's a good opportunity for that as well. Um, so how, what are the pros for you of studying medieval and modern languages, Cambridge? I think definitely the, the reason I applied was because it's very interdisciplinary as a course. There's, which means basically that, that there's so much scope for doing different things and studying different things. Um, and it's not just focused on learning the language or learning the literature surrounding it. There's um, a real emphasis on like, you can pick up linguistics if you want, you can do history, um, thought, um, and it's in that way, it's really great. You can also do more than two languages. I think you can end up doing up to four. So you can pick up um, languages, which usually are ones that people wouldn't have had the chance to study in school. So stuff like Polish or Ukrainian or um, even Portuguese. So there's a lot of kind of a lot of breadth and a lot of scope to be doing lots of different things, um, which is what attracted me to it initially. Um, and I think in that way, it doesn't, I don't get bored because there can be a lot of work, but what I noticed between my course and other people doing kind of arts and humanities subjects as well, is that they often might have a week to write an essay and that's kind of their work for the week. And they also have lectures to go to, but they are spending a week doing one piece of work. Whereas I'm, there's so many different kind of facets to doing modern medieval languages that you don't really get the chance to get bored and there's a, it kind of keeps you on your toes which for me personally and just like my personality type is is great yeah so you mentioned that it's very interdisciplinary and you can take different courses other than the languages which ones what are you taking for example and what languages are you taking i don't think i mentioned it yeah, so I'm doing French and Spanish. I tried doing um, Ukrainian <laughs> this year at the start um, and I haven't carried it on just because it was a bit too much for me doing Spanish already from scratch. I, I couldn't take that right now, but um, maybe when I come back from my year abroad with a bit more of a foundation. Um, and then in terms of the kind of scheduled papers like I talked about earlier, I'm doing one Latin American culture and history um paper which is like the history of latin america and also literature throughout um its history which is great because you go all the way from um kind of like mayan texts from ages and ages ago to like three works um and then i'm also doing a french linguistics module as well which is totally different and i kind of feel like a bit of a science student sometimes with all these different graphs and stuff um <laughs> but um yeah, it's been really great and there's just there's a lot of variety so th that's been my choice oh and I'm also doing um a French audiovisual paper which is kind of somewhere between a language and a scheduled paper because it's in the in French but it's kind of dealing with like big ideas and stuff so um that's been really great as well that's very cool um so you mentioned that something that attracted you to studying this course was the flexibility that you can have in the range of languages you can study. Um, I also saw that Cambridge is ranked number two for modern and medieval languages and linguistics. And I just, I'm wondering what, what else has made you want to study this course at Cambridge compared to another university? So, yeah, I think it was the the interdisciplinary thing that really was like the main draw. And I think that when I was kind of doing the rounds and open days and stuff, um, certain universities were very focused on literature, um, which is something that I do find interesting, but I didn't want it to be my whole degree. Um, and I think that while other courses can sometimes be it might be the case that you're almost doing a literature degree in another language. Um, this doesn't really feel like that. It feels like you're doing a language degree and then as part of that, you're doing literature papers, which is um, exactly what I wanted. And I was also really excited about 
prospect of being able to pick up different languages and stuff, which I haven't been totally successful with yet, but um, hopefully at some point. <laughs> You're in your second year, you still have time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so some of the cons now, being completely honest based on your experience. Yeah, I mean, I would say whilst it's not completely literature focused, there's not a huge emphasis on the language side. Um, and you do get, you do get to, and I actually think if you do an ab initio language um, that you haven't studied before, you get a lot more support on the language side because they know, know that you're fresh to it. Um, but even within that, there are people who have done maybe AS level of that language and then come in as ab initio. So it's not always completely equal footing, but I think that would probably be the case wherever you go. Um, but I think if you do an A level language, so my French was A level, um, and after first year we don't get a huge amount of language teaching, which hasn't hasn't been detrimental. But I think that that's definitely a con is that it's not as focused. I think at other universities you might have like language labs and things like that, um, and we don't have any of that. There's still language teaching, but there's not as much of an emphasis. I think there's more the idea that you kind of figure that bit out on your year abroad. Um, and then also there is the workload is high and I don't think it's I don't think it's too high um, but the fact that you it's very supervision led means that you the supervisions don't often come from the faculty um, so they'll you'll set them up individually which means that there's not kind of the kind of wider faculty organization necessarily which and the supervisions can be a bit more kind of here and there and because it's not kind of um, all being overseen by the faculty you can have much heavier weeks or lighter weeks in terms of work because it's not kind of necessarily being not regulated but it's just you're setting up on an individual basis which is really great because you get to know your supervisors really really well but it does mean that sometimes there can be a bit of a disparity in workload from week to week um, and yeah, I think I think that's the the general cons I would say. So. Right. <laughs> um, you mentioned your workload um, before. How do you balance your workload with your social life? I think it can be hard from time to time. Like I, I won't lie, it, the workload can sometimes get intense. Um, and also because the terms are slightly shorter than a lot of other universities. So we only have eight week long terms. Um, so everything's just kind of smushed into the smaller space. And there, there are kind of stressful bits, but I think because everybody is, is in the same boat and everybody is having an eight week term and has a quite similar workload, there's a kind of general understanding that people don't push for you to kind of come out if you're not able to um, and you just have to get an essay deadline done um, but also similarly I think it's quite rare that you're actually having to completely you, there aren't really many points where you have to completely disregard your social life for your work and I think because everybody is working quite hard it's it can actually be quite fun and there's a kind of strange camaraderie and everybody going to the library during the day and everybody just gets their work done and then by the evening you kind of are ready to let off steam um and it's like and it's definitely an intense way of living but I think it's manageable and I I was terrible when I before I started uni like I would procrastinate absolutely everything and I think I just kind of have learned over the last two years that it's it's just better to go to the library with everyone else and get it done and then you can kind of socialize afterwards um so it's definitely manageable. You just have to kind of learn some time management skills, which has been a bit of a process for me. Speaking of socializing, can you tell us about some social opportunities that you have at your university? Yeah, I mean, there's so much. And I was really, really worried before I came. And I remember being like, oh my goodness, there's like nothing going on. Um, and it's not a massive city and all this kind of thing. But I think the fact that I was having those worries means that lots of other people also have those worries and like there are a lot of people who 
are down to be socializing all the time um it's a lot more vibrant than i would have imagined in cambridge um but like that just does make sense because it's a student city and i think wherever there are students there's going to be stuff on um there's like nightclubs and bars and there's also if you're not as into that kind of thing there's like a lot of kind of arts events as well um quite like varied kind of um political and like activist scene as well um lots of theatre there's like there's so much that you can get involved with um and yeah it's a lot more varied than I had expected which is great <laughs> yeah you mentioned not expecting the social life in Cambridge and one of the stereotypes of Cambridge is that it's very hard working clever people um you end up staying in a bubble and it's like posh and snobbish people um that like yeah. to row <laughs> I do rowing <laughs> a lot so do you have any comments do you want to add something do you want to break that down um anything yeah about? I mean I think, yeah I, oh, it's funny because I think wherever there are stereotypes they do come from somewhere and I'm sure that at one point that was the case and I'm not going to lie and say that Cambridge is like the most diverse place ever because it's not and it has to get a lot better at that and I think it is getting better but they do still have a very long way to go um in terms of kind of access and stuff um but I do think that it's getting there and I think every year you hear about more kind of state school successful applications and stuff so I think it's definitely going in the right direction um so it's yeah it's a sh it's a shame that some of the stereotypes can be true but i think that because there's it is i do really think it is changing at the moment um i think that's getting less and less true and also that there will be like-minded people wherever and i know that i've made like loads of great friends who i would never call them snobby and obsessed with rowing and only want to work so i think like there are definitely um really really great people here um and they're not that difficult to find <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> um, is there anything that you weren't expecting when you applied? Something that came up as a shock um, or a surprise? So you mentioned, you know, the social life. It's something maybe of the content or, or anything else about like university life. Yeah, I think the supervisions are a lot more relaxed than I expected. Um, and I think also because when I was applying and obviously the interview is kind of everyone tells you that it's terrifying and everyone and then also then you hear people saying oh the interview is basically like a simulation for a supervision and they're seeing how you are under pressure so I kind of had this realization once I got in like oh my goodness I'm now gonna have to do an interview like every week and that's terrifying um but they're actually nothing like the interview and the interviews aren't actually that bad themselves they're not as scary as everyone makes out I don't think um and then the supervisions are way less scary than that as well um and it I think it can definitely be intimidating because a lot of the time you're speaking to these people who are kind of like world experts in something and you're just kind of sitting in their office in a big chair and you don't really know what to do um but they are actually really really nice all of them and it's a lot more relaxed and um yeah they're just a lot more chill than you would expect so that was like a very good surprise um and I think maybe like I mentioned before the kind of slight lack of language stuff beyond first year for post a level languages was a bit of a surprise um and yeah I don't think it's like so so terrible because I think I'm still doing stuff in the target language but that was um that was a bit of a surprise, but that also may just have been a result of my poor research before I came here. Um, you also mentioned the seminars and just to clarify all of the different <laughs> forms of teaching. Um, yeah, the difference between the supervisions and the seminars. Yeah, so supervisions are usually about two students and one supervisor, um, about an hour long, and that's kind of you're you're kind of speaking the whole time it's very much focused on like your ideas and you expanding them um a seminar would kind of be like a step kind of 
not above or below just like away from that so maybe around 10 people um and that's kind of I would say between a lecture and supervision in that you're encouraged to kind of talk and add anything that you're thinking but there's also kind of elements to it which are a bit more like a lecture so the person leading the seminar might be kind of speaking a bit more and give a bit of a rundown on what you're studying before you get into it and it's more discursive and then a lecture is um completely different like a lot more people the people taking that paper and then you I'm sure if you want to you can put your hand up and say your ideas but um that doesn't happen as much it's a bit terrifying isn't it <laughs> lecture of 300 people <laughs> Um, I also saw that you have computer assisted language learning facilities. Uh, do you use this? Do you know about this? Is it true? I have not used that so far. Um, potentially that's because of the pandemic though. Right. Um, I guess all my work is computer assisted at the moment because it's all just on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, there's a language center, which is, um, kind of outside of the faculty um, and it's kind of something else in its own right and you can you can also get grants from your college usually to learn another language there and it doesn't count for your degree um, and also anybody doing any course can do that and I know that they have kind of like language labs and computers and stuff there I'm not 100% sure what that's referring to um, but yeah it might be that I've missed it just because we haven't really been allowed up the house for years. So. Right, yeah, You're using computer all the time. <laughs> um, would you have any module recommendations? Is there anything, your favorite modules and why? Sorry, papers. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> same thing. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I've really enjoyed everything I've done, actually. I've been quite lucky. Um, I mentioned earlier that I did um, try Ukrainian for a bit and I think that that adding a language which maybe other people may just have a kind of foundation in just because they're doing an, a similar language like Russian for example I would say I wouldn't recommend necessarily doing that because it's it's just very they say that you can do it, but I think it's it's very difficult to be in a class with people who speak Russian trying to learn Ukrainian when you don't have any foundation in that. Um, but I would definitely recommend, I've heard loads of people who do kind of French, German, Spanish, doing Catalan and Portuguese and loving it. Um, and then as far as stuff I've done, I did um, this, yeah, Latin American culture and history and literature paper this year, which has been amazing and like, so much breadth um on that and just like loads and loads of different ideas and stuff so that's been great um and then i tried linguistics as well like i said for french this year which was really interesting quite a lot more sciencey than i expected but um definitely interesting to try out um and yeah it's, it's interesting so those are the only ones that i've kind of chosen so far um because in first year you are just kind of given your first year on a plate and you, there's not too much choice. Um, but I think actually that was great because there was loads of stuff that I never would have thought to do, like all the kind of medieval French stuff that I was sort of dreading before I arrived. Um, but actually it turns out it's really cool and a lot more progressive than you would think. Um, so yeah, I think in terms of recommendations, just I would recommend to just kind of keep it as broad as possible and there's so many different kind of like avenues you can go down doing like literature linguistics or history and stuff but um I think yeah just keeping it all open is really cool um so I'm wondering the structure over the years you mentioned that in second year you don't have as much uh the language part um I know you have your year abroad so if you can speak about that but also in terms of content, um, you, you refer a lot to the breadth and I'm sure that's really important, but is there also for people that are interested in specializing a bit more over the years um, based on you know the obligatory first year papers? Do, do you know some information about that if they have the chance to specialize? Yeah, definitely, you, you definitely can. I've 
chosen to keep it wide just because that's what I'm interested in um but you can very much like veer towards one language if you want um and don't quote me on this because I might be wrong but I'm sure you can find it on the website online um but there's I think going into second year you only have to do one scheduled paper from um a language and then you can kind of weigh everything else towards something else so I didn't have to do French schedule papers this year because I'd already um done it post a level and kind of done my first year but I wanted to so that's why I'm doing them um so yeah you, you definitely can specialize and I know um planning I'm planning my year abroad at the moment and I'm just planning to go to Spanish speaking countries because my Spanish is not as good as my French so far which obviously would be the case um and then I think coming back from my year abroad you can even though I wouldn't have done French on that I can continue to do French um papers when I get back but I also don't have to um and I can specialize in Spanish I think I could probably even specialize in French to be honest if I wanted to coming back um so yeah I think you can keep it as narrow or as wide as you like which is good it's quite flexible and in terms of the year abroad, I saw you can also split it between two countries. Um, is that true? Do you know about yeah, the yeah, support yeah. as well you would get to get into the country and the university you want? Yeah, so I'm I'm kind of going through that process at the moment, which is, yeah, super exciting. Um, and I'm splitting mine. Um, and you can split it between two countries and two different languages. So... For a while, I was thinking about doing the first half in France and then going somewhere Spanish speaking. Um, but in the end, I've chosen to go to Spain um, for like the first semester of um, university there. And then I'm going to go to Argentina afterwards for the rest of the year abroad. Um, and so far, it's it's been pretty kind of easy going uh, as far as organising it's been concerned. Um, we just had to indicate for the kind of, they're not Erasmus anymore, but the kind of, I think it's Turing, um, they're calling it now, the European study placements, you just indicate which one you want to go to, and they already have um, links with the universities, so that's pretty straightforward, you don't have to kind of apply or anything, it's just a direct transfer, because I think they take people from those universities here for a year or something. Um, and then with Latin America, it's slightly different because there's not the same structure in place with the whole kind of Erasmus or ex-Erasmus thing. So I have to apply to that independently, um, which is also fine. I don't think it's um, super taxing to do that. Um, and you also, so I have, I spoke earlier about my director of studies um, and I had a meeting with her I've had two meetings with her so far this year to kind of talk about my year abroad plan. So there's people there as well if you want to talk to them. So yeah, it seems quite um, well organised as far as I can work out, but I'm kind of only at the start of that so far. Well, good luck and it's very exciting where you're going. <laughs> um, you mentioned earlier exams and uh, some papers maybe are without exams. Can you tell us about how you're assessed and maybe give us an example? Yeah, so um, most things are exam based, which is, I don't know, I think it just depends on what you, the way you like being assessed, um, whether or not that's something people kind of want or not. Um, so yeah, most things are um, exam based, but in second year, you can choose to do long essay if you're a paper that you have chosen allows it so some papers I think most actually um, allow you to do a long essay so for my Latin American culture and history paper I've done I'm doing the long essay option which means um, I've already submitted one piece of coursework which I did during the Christmas holidays and I'll have one to do which I'm like starting working on at the moment um, and that'll be over the Easter holidays and um, so that's just kind of takes the stress off a bit when it gets to exam season because I won't have any anything else to do with that. Um, but that's kind of the only 
option um, in second year, I think, in terms of not having being assessed by exams. And then on your year abroad, you do a year abroad project, which is like a kind of dissertation type thing. Um, so I think that's 8,000 words and you can do um, anything you want. It can be like literature or whatever, um, linguistics project. I think you can even do a translation project. Um, and then in fourth year, it seems very far away, so I'm not entirely <laughs> sure um, exactly what it is. But um, I know that you can do a dissertation again then. Um, and then I think I think language stuff is always exam based. because It kind of has to be. Um, so you'll have still have kind of speaking exams and stuff. Um, so yeah, there's there's kind of a bit of a variety, and I think it sort of changes as you go through. But um, yeah, first year is definitely all exam based. Can you give us an example of a of a essay or a paper you would write? What for the um, long essay one? Yeah, whichever. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so it was quite good actually. So last time for the long essay one, we had four different um, kind of subsections for that term. Um, so we spent like a fortnight on each one and I had a supervision for each. And then you kind of choose which one you want to do your long essay on. Um, so I ended up writing about um, this kind of section called representing the city, which is all about um, representations of like Latin American cities and like urbanization and stuff um, and it's really cool we got to do these kind of Mexican vampire horror films and stuff so it's um, but then also compare them with um, kind of more traditional um, literature and stuff so that was really really fun to do um, and it was great because I'd already had a supervision on it and I'd had um, after I'd chosen which one I wanted to do I'd had supervision with an essay plan before I went off and wrote it um, and I still had access to all the lectures and stuff so it, I think it's a really nice way of doing it and you can kind of specialize in what you found the most interesting um, that term and then I'm meant to actually be sending an email I think today about which one I've chosen for the coming holidays so. get on to that straight away <laughs> What would you say it takes to succeed in studying medieval and modern languages at Cambridge? I think it kind of it sounds really cheesy and I remember people saying this all the time when I was applying, but I think if you're really into it and you find, are you really enthusiastic about it? I, I genuinely think that's the most important thing. Um, and it can be really kind of intimidating when there's loads of people coming from all these big schools who have and I found it as well when people were like yeah I'm ab initio Spanish but I also you know have a house in Spain and all this kind of thing and it, it can be intimidating but I think any kind of enthusiasm you have and like if you're eager to learn and like throw yourself in that's gonna go a lot further than any of that um you know other stuff so I think that's really important and I think time management like I said that's definitely a skill I've had to learn um, and I think that's true wherever you go um, and I think it's, it's difficult I think just kind of yeah keeping up the momentum and also not being scared to make mistakes I think that's so key with languages and also in supervisions as well I think at the start I was so reluctant to speak because I didn't I wasn't sure if what I had to say was kind of like worthy of being heard and there's all these people who are maybe their schools have kind of kind of coached them to um speak up a bit more than was the case with me um and I didn't necessarily feel like it was a environment that I'd really been in before most of my classes at school were a lot bigger and you just didn't have that much to say generally in them um because you couldn't because there were too many people um I think then kind of thinking about not um being scared to make mistakes and just kind of saying what you think and most of the time that's completely valid and um it's actually can have some really good discussions out of what anyone says so I think that's a really big one as well just kind of going for it and not being too scared of what anyone else is thinking or 
um, saying the wrong thing or it not being kind of Cambridge enough um, mm. because it's always valid. Right. Yeah. So important. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know if you have any last remarks, something you want to add, something else you want to point out, or any advice you would give yourself, something you wish you would have you know, known when you were starting to apply. Yeah, I think, I think just back yourself. I think that's the, the main thing is if you are enthusiastic about it and you know that you really enjoy it um, and you're interested in the course, that is just like by far the most important thing. Um, and for an interview for everything, that's like if they can see that you're going to be interested and you're going to make contributions to um, teaching and stuff and in supervisions and seminars and you're actually going to enjoy it I think that's by far the most important thing so just know that that is more than enough um, of a good reason to apply um, and yeah it's a great course so yeah I would definitely recommend. Thanks so much Sasha thank you. Thanks so much everyone for watching Again, for help writing your personal statement, check out our free How to Write Your Personal Statement course for step-by-step -step statement advice from university lecturers and admissions tutors available at unirise.co.uk. You can also get your statement professionally reviewed and if you've got any questions, you can speak to one of our expert UCAS advisors for hands-on support with your application. We hope you found this interview useful. If you did and you'd like to see more interviews, then smash that like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching.